was never a thought of there is something that I deserve support with here. It was just, I'm not trying hard enough. I'm doing something wrong. I need to be better. What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 542, with today's guest, Miss Valerie Brasso. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host. I'm the show founder. I'm the Whistlekick founder. I'm, I've done a bunch of other things, but they're not really relevant. What is Whistlekick? Well, we do stuff for traditional martial arts, and it really is that broad. If you want to see all the things that we're involved in, the projects, the products, the shows, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you'll find our store. And if you make a purchase, you support us, and you can also save 15% using the code PODCAST15. You've got some other ways you can help us out too, because as you might imagine, this stuff costs money. Well, here comes the list. You can leave a review. You can follow us on social media. You can tell someone about what we do. Or you can support the Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. Patreon's a platform where we post exclusive content. And those of you who are willing to chip in, get access to it. It is as simple as that. So if you like what we do and you say, you know, Jeremy, I wish there was more. And I wish I could give you a couple bucks for it. Well, there's your opportunity. Patreon. You know what we don't charge for? This show. Every single episode we've ever done is available at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. They should all be available in your podcast player as well. Why do we make this show? We make this show to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists around the world. And today's guest is an international guest. Not terribly far away, but far enough and over a border. We have Miss Valerie Brasso, hailing from Canada, from Ontario. And our discussion today starts out fairly normal, fairly typical of the subject matter that we tackle here on Martial Arts Radio, but then it, uh, it shifts. And I knew that shift was coming. You might not have seen it if it wasn't for this intro. We go deep. We talk about some really personal stuff, and I want to thank her. I want to thank Ms. Brasso for her trust in letting this conversation unfold as it did. Instead of saying more, I'll just let you listen. Ms. Brasso, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. This should be fun. It will be fun. Well, if I do my job right, it's fun. <laughs> or, or, or maybe if it's not fun, I'll just, I can blame you. I don't know. I don't know how, how I'm supposed to look at that if it doesn't go well. Is it my fault or is it the guest's fault? <laughs> Let's share the blame. That's fair. That's fair. Very <laughs> diplomatic of you. I appreciate that. You know, we were we were chatting before we got rolling, listeners, that you have a distinction that that we've only had, I want to say, two or three people on in years that you have in common with them. Any idea what that is? Hmm. Yes. It's not quite a hard and fast rule, but it's one that we don't break very often. And it's around rank. Oh, yes, of course. So yeah, I... and it's and the reason that we do that is because in the early days, I tried to have some people on who I, I thought would have really good stories, and I knew they had really good stories, but they hadn't spent the time in front of a class, so they mm -hmm. weren't comfortable talking. Mm -hmm. But you, you come equipped with something else that has you ready to go. Yes, I do. That's actually what I do for a living. I'm a public speaker, so... It's a, a great combination. I'm happy to share my experience, despite, despite the fact that it's not quite at the black belt level. <laughs> You'll get there. Get there. Something to engage with, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's such an interesting thing because any of the rules that we have, by nature, I'm someone who pushes back on rules and, and I don't like boundaries and everything. But yet all the rules that we have regarding the show come from me. You know, so I had to set these rules that I don't, I don't even like. I don't like the rules that I've set out, but I need some kind of parameters to help figure some things out. And once in a while, we'll, we'll identify someone who, you know what? They break that rule, but they make up for it in this way. And that's, that's why you're here today. No pressure. <laughs> well, thank you for giving me the, giving me the space of for that. Course, of course. And, and I don't want to rush. There, there, there are some things that I'm really excited to talk to you about. But we've got to go back. We've got to lay the foundation. We've got to talk about martial arts and how martial arts found you or you found it. Where, where, where did the two of you connect, you and martial arts? We go way back. We definitely go way back. It all began with a karate class, actually. 
And I was around, I want to say 11 or 12 years old. And my brothers, I have twin brothers, they're three years younger. And they had been enrolled in karate classes. And I was the kid who wanted to do everything with her siblings. You know, of course, I, I don't really put much weight on gender roles, but at the time my parents had sort of an idea of what the boys should be doing and what the girls should be doing. But I wanted to do what my brothers were doing. I wanted to get into that karate class and uh, do, do what they were doing, train like they were. And so I started doing karate classes when I was quite young. I did that for several years. I believe it was about about seven years. I was 17 when I earned my black belt in uh, Shitoryu Karate. And then as I grew older and sort of evolved in my sparring and grew into my, my strength and my awareness of what my body was capable of, I sought out martial arts that were a little bit more full contact, a little bit more maybe practical to real life situations. And that's how I ended up in Muay Thai. So I was training in Muay Thai for several years at a gym that was an MMA gym in Montreal. Actually, GSP has trained there, which is pretty cool. And, mm -hmm. and throughout the Muay Thai classes, I sort of made friends with the guys in the jiu-jitsu class and they would grab me after class and, you know, sort of toss me around like a rag doll. And I realized I had absolutely no ground game until they did that. I had no idea what ground game even was. And so I eventually said, you know what, I got to get into these classes because I got to I got to be able to stand up to these guys. I mean, it was just friendly, you know, friendly play fighting, but I, I wanted to be able to hold my own. So I started the jujitsu classes and I, I absolutely fell in love. I loved the athleticism of it, the mental aspect, the strategy, and I really saw the practical application as well. So it was something that I was really drawn to once once those guys sort of introduced me to it. I kept up with Muay Thai for some time, and then I actually had plans to go into MMA, and I had a an amateur fight lined up, and I started training. I did more wrestling at that point to get that going as well, worked on my fitness in general, cardio, all of that, and unfortunately, I tore my shoulder in a training session, and so I backed out of the fight, and I sort of reflected a bit at that point, and I thought... It would be an amazing challenge to step up to. However, due to injuries and just how how it, it is a very difficult sport on your body. And I had such a love for jujitsu that I decided to just focus on competing in that sport. So that's how I sort of migrated to being mainly a jujitsu person. But it all started back in the day with that with that first karate class and just falling in love with the discipline, the body awareness, the confidence that it gave me and and a physical outlet as well. Mm. Interesting. You know, as you're talking about jujitsu, you're talking about the the strategy, and and I've talked to a number of people who describe it as this kind of this real time puzzle. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got your body and somebody else's body, and you know, of course, things can unfold very quickly, but quite often it's at a more moderate pace. I think any combat sport is that real time puzzle. There are openings. There are places you might want to go, maybe don't want to go. But it seems like it's really front and center in jujitsu more so than other arts are puzzled. And this is a very long-winded way to get to the question. <laughs> Have you always been that sort of analytical, puzzle-solving sort of person? I, I have, actually. It's interesting because I've never actually thought of making that connection between that part of my personality and why I love the art so much. But I was the kid who... Um, loved school, read a lot. I have a degree in archaeology and I have a love for history. So that analytical sort of seeing how things unfold based on cause and effect and a little bit of psychology as well, how, how people work. And I find that that fits into jujitsu as well. And so that anal analytical side of me definitely appreciates that about jujitsu and the fact that you have to think about all right, so if I use this technique, this move, that's going to prompt them to do this, which will then give me an opening to do this. And it's uh, being a couple steps ahead, which is, which is really interesting. And that's always been something that, um, that I've been drawn to for sure. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I've never quite thought of it that way. <laughs> that ten, I, I told you before we got started, you know, listeners, as you might imagine, there's kind of a pre-show chat that I go through every, with everyone. And one of the things that I told you was, one of the hallmarks of this show is, you know, you having the space to talk and tangents and everything. Apparently, one of the things I'm known for is asking really weird questions that nobody else has asked before. 
So I, I, you know, I take some pride in that. I like that. Connecting dots. Yeah. Now, how about the transition from karate to Muay Thai to BJJ? Obviously, there are some things that you can look at and say, you know, that was really helpful. It helped my mindset. What about the opposite? Were there, were there any habits that you carried forward from your time in karate that were less than positive? Absolutely. Things that I, I wouldn't call them negative, just not quite appropriate for the new art that I was stepping into. So I know sure. that I struggled a lot from karate to Muay Thai with my my stance and my my guard with the way my hands were up for, for striking in an art that's more... I would say more realistic karate is I did compete in that for some time and a lot of point sparring and it's a it's a different mindset and a different way of using your body so when I transitioned to Muay Thai I really had to learn to um well, one of the things I had to learn was to really take a punch which um sure will wake you up in the morning <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure so karate was a little bit less full contact and I really had to metaphorically beat out of me that that stance and that guard that I had from karate and uh, keep my hands closer, keep them further up. There is that sort of outwards fist in front of you for karate type of stance and um, and a wider stance front to back as well, um, as well as other stances that fit into the katas that make sense for that, but are maybe not super practical for a live full contact um, sparring sport. Sure. So that's definitely something I had to adjust to and uh, do a lot of drilling, a lot of shadow boxing to, to work on that. But it helped me transition my body into that awareness and that stance where I felt like I could defend myself better and had a, an understanding of a, of a form that made more sense. I, I don't want to say on the streets, I'm not somebody who would ever resort to violence unless it was absolutely self-defense, but, um, and I, and I would rarely want to go toe to toe with someone. If I were in that situation, I would probably try more controlling techniques from jujitsu, but I did feel that should I be in a position where someone is throwing a punch, the Muay Thai stance and, and way of doing things was a lot more realistic than, than the way karate was set up. But that being said, I like I said, I don't want to call it a negative because karate did give me that initial awareness of my body, spatial awareness, awareness of what my strength was, how hard I could throw a punch, how much I could withstand when I was blocking a punch, that kind of thing, and um, balance, agility, all of that stuff. So it's all things that I carried forward. I just had to adjust to the new style and the new technique, which, of course, after doing karate for seven years was a bit of an adjustment in terms of that muscle memory for sure. Mm. I can imagine. Now that almost fight that you had, where you, mm -hmm. you injured your shoulder, do you think if that fight had happened, it would have had much of a change on your life and what you're doing now? I think it would have. I, I know, mm, I mean, it's not to say that I'm not confident now, but it would have given me an understanding of confidence and of what I'm capable of in terms of persevering through through pain, through hardship. And uh, we can get a little bit later on into some of the hardships that have shaped me in other ways, but that would have been an interesting one for sure to have that experience. And it may have, I can't say for sure at this point, but it may have been a path that I would have continued on. And who knows how far I would have gone. I definitely am somebody who has that that perseverance and that commitment to doing what I do 100%. So. It's uh, something that if I had gotten in there and it really lit a fire under me and I, I felt it in my soul that that was something I really loved, I would have pushed forward with it. And again, who knows how far, how far I would have gone with that. Mm -hmm. What other things have you pushed for in your life like that? That's an interesting question. And you said you encourage tangents. So I, I do. Let's take one. To side. Sounds good. Um, I can relate my martial arts journey and what I push through for in terms of tournaments and challenging myself in situations that uh, make me maybe uncomfortable or feel vulnerable or feel weak. Um, I find that there's a great parallel between that and the mental health journey that I've taken. And it's um, a topic that some people shy away from. And I, I did for quite some time, but I have learned that there's, there's power in sharing that. 
And it's a great way to connect with people and make them feel less alone and, and have this understanding that we, we all go through things. So I definitely had to push through in terms of that mental health journey. I, um, I'm diagnosed with two different disorders and it has been a heck of an experience for sure. Something that you have to learn to manage and find the strength to, um, to overcome. And it's not like a broken leg. It's not something that you heal and then it's done with. It's something that you manage for your entire life. And that doesn't mean that there isn't hope that it doesn't get better. It just means that it's always something you have to be accountable for. And I really like to say that mental illness is not your fault and not something to be blamed for. However, it is your responsibility to heal and to manage the symptoms that you have that make mm -hmm. your life a little bit more challenging. So being in martial arts and having to push forward in a position, for example, where you know, I'm inside control. I feel like I can't breathe. I feel like I, I want to tap purely from the pressure because it's making me panic and it's bringing up my anxiety. And I, I feel like I just can't make it, but having to push through that and think, you know, I'd give it a few minutes. If I keep working the techniques that I know I can get out of this position and then drawing that parallel to having that psychological pain, that's extremely distressing and thinking, if I push forward, there will be hope. I just have to push through. I have to reach out for help when I need it. I have to use the tools and the strategies that I'm learning to manage the things that are causing me that psychological distress. So I, I do find quite a bit of a parallel there. And yeah. both have sort of helped the other. That, that's a pretty solid one-to-one. -one. We don't usually get analogies that are that blatantly related. Did you go into jujitsu knowing that you could approach it in that way or was that something that you know you're 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 under someone you're you know they have you inside control and you just kind of oh this is very much like the way i have to face some of these other challenges in my life that's definitely something that kind of that connection kind of manifested as i learned about myself as i learned about the ways you can overcome a challenge and as i as i saw that parallel more and more it became a lot more powerful and helpful in in sort of managing both like i said they do influence one another so it's not something i had in mind when i started jujitsu i was i was young i'm i'm 32 now i was 21 or 22 and i just um you know thought i i could be the baddest chick around and 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 be the toughest and i wanted to get into all these martial arts and i wanted i wanted to do it all but the more that i grew in the sport and the art and the more that i realized what what I was bringing to it as well as what it was pulling out of me and what it was teaching me, I began to see that that parallel and the sort of crux of my mental health crisis happened a few years into my jujitsu path. And it sort of became apparent that I could use jujitsu as a tool to see what I'm capable of doing in managing my mental health, as well as just managing mental health within a jujitsu setting. It, um, it can be very difficult to compete when you are prone to anxiety, when you have things that you struggle with. I, um, there's an article on my blog, actually, I did some research, um, some interviews and polls with quite a few competitors about competing with a mental illness and how they manage it, whether it's something they bring up with professional help, if that's something that they have in their life. Uh, the best tools they have for managing that. Interestingly enough, the tools that came up the most were breathing and music, which are extremely powerful things for managing your mental health and even just for managing the regular stress of being a competitor. So it's interesting to see that, that connection between the two. It's sort of like competing with a mental illness is like competing as somebody who's perhaps a little bit more psychologically healthy, but sort of cranked up to the next level. So I definitely learned a lot as I took that, that journey through martial arts and, and eventually realized the connection that you're mentioning. It wasn't something that I knew from the beginning was going to be helping me with, with what I was experiencing in terms of mental health. Mm. Mm. Why was it important for you to be tough? That's an interesting question. That's, um... the, the, way, the way, and here's why I asked that. The way mm -hmm. you said it, you didn't just say, you know, I wanted to hold my own with the people around me, or I wanted to, you know, quite often we, we have women on who will make a statement somewhere around, I wanted to prove to the guys, I wanted to show them that, you know, I could do what they could do. But you said, I wanted to be the toughest chick around. 
Yeah. There's some history in that statement. Definitely. It's a bit of a vulnerable question. I'm not going to lie. And I'm happy to answer it. It just really makes me dig deep and, and reach into things that, that sort of influence the, the core of who I am, if you will. And mm. it's something that came up, first of all, as a, as a child, we didn't, and by we, I mean my family and I, and probably friends as well, we didn't really realize at that time that I was growing up developing a mental illness, but we just knew that I, that I struggled, that I was a kid who was sometimes sad for no reason. I was a kid who had trouble embracing sort of my individuality and my, the unique aspects of who I was. And so that was at times painful and I, I was bullied quite a bit. I, um, I actually skipped two grades, which when you think about it now in terms of socially being adjusted and, and being uh, socialized properly as a child is just not, not healthy for a kid. And eventually I went back one grade by doing grade eight, once in French, once in English to perfect my English because I learned English when I was 10. And so that brought me back a bit in the right age group, but it was still really difficult being that, that youngest kid who was a, a little bit weird in what she liked doing. And there was a lot of bullying. There was a, um, a student once in my grade seven and eight split class who began a petition that none of the kids in the class should be friends with me and pretty much everyone signed it, which for a seventh grader is pretty devastating. So I, I guess I sort of felt like I had something to prove partially to the world and partially to myself. And I grew up in a house where standards were pretty high in terms of toughness. I mean, it doesn't mean that I wasn't nurtured as a kid, but um, definitely a, a penchant for toughness and mental toughness and, and getting through things and persevering. And I, I grew up thinking that that was sort of one of the main traits I should be displaying. And it is an important trait for sure, but vulnerability is also super powerful, which I've learned as I've gotten older and gone through my mental health journey. But at, at that time when I was younger, in my early 20s and my late teens, it seemed like quite the priority for me and martial arts seemed like a great way to get there. I uh, put a lot of weight on on mental and physical toughness, and I, yeah, definitely a, a bit of a feeling of having something to prove. Mm. Do you still have that feeling? I'm learning to work through it to sort of transition it into a feeling of wanting to be the best I can be without unhealthy pressure or without that idea that physical toughness or absolute mental toughness is the only way to, to prove my worth. I'm, I'm trying to sort of temper that feeling and make it a little healthier in the way that it pushes mm -hmm. me rather than, than the way I sort of experienced it in my early 20s. Here's a question coming out of my own life, and, and I'll, sure. I'll, I'll, ex, I'll expand in a moment if, 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 if we get there. Have you ever sabotaged something that was going well because you are so comfortable playing the role of the underdog? Oh, that is a good question. <laughs> I have. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience, but I, um, if if I answer first, I, I do feel like that MMA fight. I mean, shoulders heal. <laughs> mm. I I could have I could have lined one up once I had healed. I that was one thing where it. I don't want to say it was an easy out because I'm, I'm not, or I like to think I'm not somebody who, who would do something like that, but there was a bit of a, a bit of a feeling of, well, if I leave the possibility open, it's sort of like Schrodinger's cat. I've both won and lost that fight because it never happened. Yeah. I get it. I get it. I, I've been pretty public over the last couple of years and not even a couple of years as I've come to grips with you know, some of the things that I face around anxiety and, and listeners, if, if you want to hear more about my thoughts on that, we did that on episode 455. You know, I was pretty real mm -hmm. about that because yeah, you know, a lot of what you're saying is, uh, is resonating for me. And I suspect for a lot of other people. Yeah, it's definitely an experience that is, um, that is common in a way. Everybody experiences it differently, but it's kind of a human journey to find 
your place and those things you feel you have to prove transition them to a, a healthier way of, of viewing that and of letting mm. it push you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to, I want to kind of unpack this just a little bit more because I, I think if we spend a little bit more time here as we transition to talk about moving forward and, and what you're doing now, I think it's going to be more impactful for people. Mm -hmm. So I want to, I want to slide back. I want to go back to at some point childhood. I don't know. I don't know when that is. You'll, you'll decide that. Okay. When uh, did, sorry, you, go ahead. when did you, do you have any recollection of a moment when you realized, Hey, some of this stuff going on for me, isn't going on for everybody else. That is a good question again, because it really gets me to dig a little deeper and, and remember what my experience was as a kid of having mental health struggles, but not knowing that they were there. And it's, um, I think I always kind of, I always kind of knew I was different in terms of what I was drawn to, what my interests were. And I started realizing as I went through middle and yeah, maybe middle school that I, what it was for me really was this feeling of, you know, if I try harder, I could be better. I could be different. I could essentially be normal. And that idea that there is a normal is what, what is actually harmful. And I, I saw other kids sort of living without crumbling at every onset of emotion. And I thought, I must be doing something wrong. There was never a thought of there is something that I deserve support with here. It was just, I'm not trying hard enough. I'm doing something wrong. I need to be better. And that was something that led me to being undiagnosed and untreated for so many years because it wasn't something that I brought up in terms of here, I think I need support with this. Here, I think I'm struggling with something that maybe isn't quite normal for me to, or, or usual for me to feel this way. And I, I remember when I was about 10 years old, that was, and we're going to get a little heavy here, if that's okay. That's quite all right. Um, when I was 10 was the first time that I mentioned wanting to die. And I had mentioned to a friend uh, just a passing thought of wanting to kill myself because of the pain that I was in and her mother overheard and shared that with my mother, which is the, the responsible thing to do. And my mom approached me about speaking to someone, finding a professional to connect with. And I was 10. I was terrified. I didn't think I could open up to a stranger about what I was feeling. I wasn't even sure what I was feeling. I just knew that it was painful and my mom, of course, it, this is no fault of her own. She's, you know, parents do the best that they can. And mental illness is something that everyone needs some training and some guidance in. So she was just ill-equipped to really push further. She thought it would be more harmful to push for me to open up to a stranger rather than just offer me all the support and the love that she could and, and go from there. So it's not something, of course, I don't blame her for that. It's just looking back now, having seen a professional we would have had a diagnosis earlier. And a diagnosis is an interesting thing because many people feel that it's a, a label and something negative, something to be judged for. And they're a little fearful of having a, a diagnosis slapped on them and sort of having that follow them the rest of their lives. But for me, it gave me some hope because for me, what it meant was, okay, what I'm experiencing, there's a name for that. It's something that other people are experiencing as well. And the fact that there's a name for it means that somebody has taken the time to do the research to find treatment for it. Mm -hmm. And for me, a diagnosis was a roadmap to how to manage it. So I have really an interesting relationship with my diagnoses because I don't feel that they are a negative label. I feel that they give me the understanding that I am dealing with something that that is known that happens to other people and that there is management for the symptoms that I feel. So I, I'm acutely aware as an adult of the differences between someone who's a little bit mentally healthier and someone like me who has a diagnosed disorder. But I'm also aware of the fact that there are other people diagnosed with the same thing. And despite the fact that we're all unique individuals and treatment will vary, 
there is sort of a protocol for for dealing and managing with those disorders. So as a child, there wasn't that understanding and that awareness. It was just this sort of drowning in a sea of all these feelings and thinking, okay, well, everybody must experience these things. I'm just looking at them and they're handling it way better than I am. So I need to try harder. I need to be better. I need to just deal with it somehow. And it's a very sort of rub some dirt in it kind of approach, which is <laughs> not, not helpful. Um, you need to acknowledge and address what's going on to be able to heal from it. So it's uh, something that as a, as a child, I, I wasn't in that place yet. But it's also interesting because, um, so the, the disorders that I have, I have borderline personality disorder and I have bipolar disorder as well. And both of those are not easily diagnosed in childhood. Most professionals will wait until in the late teens or early adulthood to really narrow in on a diagnosis because the symptoms can be changing and evolving and things that we go through as we grow up, just natural feelings and stressors will be similar to some of those symptoms. So they don't want to have a misdiagnosis, especially since a lot of people do see stigma in having that label. Uh, and it and it does kind of follow you, unfortunately. So we we don't want to just slap that diagnosis uh, without really being sure. So in in childhood, a lot of disorders, there's a hesitance to diagnose those right away. But we would at least have had an idea if of, of how to handle it if I perhaps didn't have that innate belief that it was simply a, a flaw in character rather than a than a psychological condition. I appreciate you sharing that. It doesn't sound like you held anything back. So thank you. Thank you for the, the trust with that. Now let's, let's start to roll forward again. And, you know, eventually you end up with these diagnoses and some self-awareness around what's going on. And you start to build some strategies on how to manage or cope or, or whatever word you might insert here. Where does martial arts start to fit in to that toolkit? It's something that is definitely a large part of that toolkit. It is so many things rolled into one. It's a physical outlet. It's an emotional outlet. It's a, a team and a family. It's something that allows me to feel worth within myself, something that allows me to see my body for what it can accomplish rather than what it looks like so many things when it comes to, to martial arts being a part of that that process and that journey and really i didn't quite realize it with karate because i was too young but it it did give me friends with a common interest where i wasn't judged and i fit in and it gave me a sense of agency in my in my own body and in my own life by being able to be 13 and spar with a, a large grown man and of course you know, he's not going full force, but I can still hold my own in terms of the technique. And that that's such a confidence builder. And then after the, the sparring match, just having that camaraderie and that respect and, and having that as well was hugely important. So I did start with karate. I think I just wasn't as aware of it. Mm -hmm. But when I really got into jujitsu, like I mentioned earlier, I started seeing those parallels. And it's something that helped me sort of use situations within jujitsu as a metaphor for other things that I dealt with and also as kind of a, a litmus test for some of the tools and strategies that I was learning. I remember one time I was rolling, I think it might have been a grading, which is always intense because there's so many people in the gym and um, everybody's, you know, trying to prove themselves and just show that they, they know what they know and they're adept at what they do. So I was rolling with somebody who was, he was quite a bit bigger than me. And I found myself on the bottom and I found myself panicking. And in that moment, I thought of the panic that I experienced sometimes in my life due to other stressors. I, I experienced panic attacks, which can be um, scary, difficult to deal with, mm -hmm. but it's something that I've learned to, to work through with certain tools. And in that moment, I felt one coming on because of that jujitsu situation. And some of the reason that came up is because I, if we take again a bit of a tangent and look at my, my competition um, path, the mental aspect of it is the huge issue for me. 
I, I know the techniques that I do, I do well. I have a specific game. It might not be super extensive, but sort of the package of techniques that I'm comfortable with, I know very well. And in, in rolling just in, in class, it's something that I feel confident doing, but I get on the mat for competitions and I, I lack that confidence. I doubt myself. And in that moment, when this, this heavier opponent was on top of me, I got that doubt in my head, that doubt started coming up of, you know, maybe you don't know what you know. Maybe you're not as adept as you think. Maybe, maybe people think that this purple belt around your waist, it, it shouldn't be there. Maybe you need to work harder and you're not there yet. And that, that self-doubt is what fueled the panic. And a very good friend of mine, um, who is somebody that I really look up to in terms of jujitsu and the way that he trains and the way that he roles and his, his dedication to the sport. He was on the sidelines and he looked at me and he could see the panic coming on. And he said, you know, I'd Val, do that, do that thing that you do. And I knew what he was talking about. He didn't really have to explain. He was referring to a, um, a grounding technique that was taught to me by another jujitsu practitioner who's also a nurse. And she taught me how to do this exercise where you start from five and count down to one. And for each number, you pick one of the senses and list things. So five things that you can see, four things that you can touch, three things you can hear, and so on. And it just brings you back into the moment, into your body, into awareness of what's going on and not that future predictive anxiety that you're having. And it really helped me. And I was able to get through the moment of, oh my gosh, he's so heavy. I'm not good at getting out of this particular position. I should tap, this is over. And just grounding myself with that technique brought me back to a moment of, okay, I need to withstand this for a moment. It's gonna be difficult, but I need to push through for just a moment and then use the techniques that I'm, I'm confident I know to get out of it and regain control of the situation. So it's, um, it's something that I've, a technique that I've used in other instances that have nothing to do with jujitsu, but sort of, um, proving that it worked and testing it out in something as high stress as a sport that puts you in physically and mentally vulnerable situations showed me that that tool was really powerful and again showed me that parallel between the path of of learning through jujitsu and finding my confidence and my my place in that art and finding the tools to manage my mental health just in, in life in general. And then moving forward, or, or maybe it even started beforehand, you know, we have this, this path that you're on, and at some point, the path flipped from solely concerning yourself to taking these things that you've learned, this toolkit that you've developed, I assume are, still are developing, and you started looking for ways that you could use it to help other people. Absolutely. When did that, that happen? That was something that became very important to me. Uh, let me see, it's 2000, almost 21. Um, about eight years ago, I started volunteering at a uh, crisis helpline. And I remember Googling any sort of kids help phone crisis distress line. I wasn't really aware of what was available in the community, but I started Googling anywhere that was taking volunteers because that was after um, going back to that that moment when I was 10 where I mentioned that I, I did have suicidal thoughts at that age. When I reached my early 20s, I had my, my first suicide attempt and surviving that made me think that I, I had to, there, there was a reason that I survived and I needed to give positive meaning to what I had been through and, and find a purpose through that. So I, I chose to start volunteering in mental health. And that being said, I <clears throat> excuse me, I speak a lot on the fact that recovery is not linear and there will be steps forwards and backwards. And this might be kind of a roundabout way to get to answering your question, but um, it, it's not linear. It's not a straight line. There are stumbles and what matters is that you pick yourself up. It's not about having a perfect track record. It's about persevering when things get tough and you maybe take a bit of a step backwards. So I had that suicide attempt, I was determined to make a change, make something positive out of those battles and, and help others. And I started volunteering. And uh, several years into that, that tenure as a volunteer at that center, I had 
two more suicide attempts, which were much more severe. And when I survived the third one, um, that's when I really wanted to push more for that helping of others and using that experience to affect some change and show people that they're, that they're not alone. And I think it's because it got so bad. I was so consumed with the symptoms that I was experiencing and in so much emotional and psychological distress that I, I mean, it's, it's something that I am cautious in the way that I phrase because it's not something, of course, to be encouraged. It's definitely not the solution or the decision to make in those moments. However, when you're in that dark place, it almost feels like it's decided for you. Like there's so much pain that you can find no other escape. And so that's why those attempts were much more severe. I actually was in a, in a coma for nearly a week. And when I woke up from that, that's when I really realized if, it, if it's gotten this bad and if it was that severe and I'm still around, despite the fact that they thought perhaps I wouldn't wake up, I, I did wake up and I'm here and I see family in the room and people who want me to be here for a long time. And that's when I decided to really push forward with that advocacy and that supporting others through my experiences. And I ended up getting involved. This is how it connects back to jujitsu. I ended up getting involved in Submit the Stigma, which became extremely important to me because in a sport where mental toughness is really pushed and something that to, to an extent is necessary for competing and for persevering in this, in this sport, but we need to leave space for vulnerability as well. And that's what Submit the Stigma as a movement and a nonprofit was advocating for and pushing for. And I really, that resonated with me a lot and with what I had been through to understand that it's okay to have those stumbles. It's okay to have those steps backwards. You just have to pick yourself back up. And it doesn't matter how many times you have to pick yourself back up. The fact that you can do that is what shows your strength. And the fact that you can reach for help when you need it is a sign of strength as well. So being involved in Submit the Stigma really gave me a place where I could help, not only with regards to mental health, but more specifically within a community that had become very important to me. So I was doing volunteer work and starting to build my business in mental health in terms of the general population, but being able to focus a bit of that solely on jujitsu was amazing to me because I wanted to give back to that community that had given me so much. Mm. Good stuff. Now you've used the word vulnerable a couple times. And of course, if we, if we think solely about the subject you're talking about, it makes all kinds of sense. And yet there's this interesting contrast with us being here on a martial arts podcast, discussing martial arts and, and some of these adjacent aspects of your life. What does vulnerability mean to you? It's something that comes up in so many different situations and something that is stigmatized a little bit. It's seen as, as weakness. It's seen as something that shows that we can't handle what's thrown at us. However, for me, it's the complete opposite. What it means to me is being able to face those challenges head on by admitting and acknowledging I'm not okay right now. And either I can pull from the resources that I have in terms of personality traits, characteristics, things that I've learned, strength that I've built and resilience I've built over the years. And that might be enough. Um, and admitting that I need those things and I'm not just going to shove the challenge down and, and just, again, that sort of rub that dirt in it attitude. But it also means being vulnerable to other people. It means being open to acknowledging to others that you need support. And that's something that I find both exist in jujitsu. It's just perhaps not something we sort of directly pinpoint because again, there's such a focus on that mental toughness and especially with competitors and people who are more active on the competition scene, but acknowledging that we are having a struggle, we are facing a challenge is hugely important to figuring out how to overcome it. And that can be vulnerability of realizing that we need our own help and we have to pull from those things that we innately have within us to overcome things. For example, 
getting through that position where we feel physically vulnerable in a jujitsu match because that physical vulnerability is there as well. I mean, we're in positions where we can get injured. We're trusting our training partners to know when enough is enough. We're trusting ourselves to tap when enough is enough. So physically vulnerable for sure, but mentally and emotionally vulnerable as well. And there's that admitting that we have to push a little harder and, and sort of pull from those resources. And then there's admitting that we need the people around us. And that's why we fight one-on-one, -on -one, but jujitsu is a, a team sport. There are people there to support you. There are people there teaching you. There are people guiding you. There are people to offer you the help that you need when you need a bit more of a push or a reminder that you, you can overcome these things. So vulnerability to me is at, at its core is being open and acknowledging what we're feeling and trusting other people with that information. And that's where it goes both ways. If we are going to be open to being vulnerable, we have to be open to others being vulnerable as well and become a safe, non-judgmental space. So to me in jujitsu, that means, you know, oh, I'm super anxious about this match. I've heard that this girl is really tough. I am nervous about letting my team down or fighting in front of a a huge audience and not doing perhaps as well as I wish I could. And knowing that there will be a teammate there who will not tell you to just, you know, buck up, you can do this, but explore a bit of what you're feeling and allow you a space to feel it. And that's how you overcome something. You first have to, to feel it and sort of ride that wave for a little bit before jumping to a solution based approach. And that's something that I advocate for and write quite a bit about and, and teach about in my business is that idea of um, toxic positivity, pushing for an immediate jump to, it's going to be okay, you're fine, just push through it. We have to sit with the bad for a moment before we can move forward to the solution and finding the good again. So meeting someone where they are emotionally can be extremely validating and help somebody find the, the safe feeling to be vulnerable. And that's something that definitely relates to things I've experienced in jujitsu and then in, in my personal life as well. So vulnerability mm. is extremely powerful. And I think it's necessary to relationships in general, whether that's a leadership relationship even, which seems counterintuitive because we think of a leader as that ultimate sort of guidepost for what we should be, how we should be handling things and somebody who's eternally strong and can push through but a leader showing their vulnerability as well and putting trust in the people they're leading to be that safe space for them sets an example for that, that discourse and that exchange. And that's something that I've appreciated of, of black belts I've trained under who are able to say even the simplest things such as, you know, I get nervous before a match too in a tournament. Let's talk about it a little bit, you know? And I see that you lack that, that confidence and that's what's killing you in your, in your matches. Let's talk about that a little bit and how you can build that confidence more. So vulnerability all around, extremely important to relationships, to important to pushing through things and, and working through them more rather than pushing. And it's something that we need to understand is not a weakness and is actually, it, it creates strength and it fosters resilience. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. Someone that I respect very greatly is fond of saying there is strength in vulnerability, mm -hmm. which has taken me a long time to unpack. And, and I don't even think I fully have it yet, you know, mm -hmm. conceptually, but I've, I've got enough of it to understand the wisdom. Yeah. Absolutely. Something I'm working on myself. And I love the point that you brought up the idea that, you know, these, these high ranking martial artists, these people we look up to, being vulnerable, being open with the challenges that they face, that they get nervous before a match, things like that. So those of you out there who teach, who own schools, you don't have to have this rigid barrier between your students and yourself. In fact, the more I think that you break them down, I'm curious what, what you think about this, the more right. those barriers are broken down, the easier it is for your students to imagine attaining what you have someday the more realistic it becomes. I think that's very true. And seeing a, a high ranking martial artist that we look up to and who leads us in a team as something other than the movable force that never cracks and never struggles with anything. That's, 
that's not a, a healthy approach to leadership. And it does break down that barrier and create a sense of, you know, this person is, is admirable in many ways, but they are human and I can reach that level and I can um, aspire to what they're able to share with their students. And, and when teaching has vulnerability attached to it, I find that it's so much more powerful and resonates more with people. It's definitely something that um, should be cultivated in, in everyone, but in somebody who is looked up to, it can be, yeah, it can be extremely powerful. Let's talk about your business. We, we've kind of danced around it a bit. So now let's, let's jump in headlong. What is it that you do? So what I do is sort of two-pronged. I am a public speaker and an advocate. So I offer, I lead workshops. I speak at conferences, events, fundraisers, um, any event that has the need for that mental health discourse to be um, to be fostered and to be opened up. Um, there's, for example, I, I have uh, a client who is having a book launch and one of the characters in her book has a mental illness and she wanted somebody who's well-versed in that subject to come speak at the book launch to connect between the reality and the way that it was presented in the book. So that's just a bit of an example of the diversity of things that I do. So speaking engagements, I did a TEDx talk last November, which was an amazing experience. And that public speaking is something that really lights me up and that I, I love to be able to do, to connect with a crowd and share that experience so that every person in that room feels like they're coming away from it, feeling a little bit less alone and understanding a little bit better. And the other prong of it is support that I offer. So I do one-on-one -on -one support as a mental health I would call it sort of a, a mentor or a coach. It's uh, something similar to peer support, but I do have training and education behind me as well. It's just not therapy as I'm not a, a clinical psychologist, but I find that that peer aspect to it really connects with people. So so one-on-one -on -one support and um, groups as well that I lead where we look at concrete tools and strategies like that one I mentioned that the the nurse that I knew had shown me concrete things we can implement in our lives to better our mental health and better manage what we struggle with, whether we have a mental illness or we just have our regular management of mental health that we do in our daily life. So those are sort of the two sides of it. And I love both equally. They're both very different in the way that it, that it helps people, but all of it just makes me feel so passionate and so grateful that I have the opportunity to use my experiences to support others and to promote understanding and education and awareness when it comes to mental health. Mm. Mm. We, we talked about how martial arts, you know, entered your toolkit became, how do I want to say this? We've talked about how martial arts has come into the other aspects of your life. Mm -hmm. How about the reverse? How about some of this, this work that you do, some of these skills that you've developed outside of martial arts, how have you brought those back in? How is your martial arts different because of those experiences versus someone who hasn't had those experiences? It's definitely something that, as I mentioned before, goes both ways. And in terms of the mental health journey impacting the martial arts journey, it put me in a position where I became very aware of my let's call them limitations, things that I have to manage and that I have to work through. And it made me aware of where they come up in my training. And then in training or competition, which sort of has an added layer of stress, sort of testing the strategies and tools that I was learning and that I still am learning for my mental health in general, testing them in a higher stress environment to deal with things that come up for me in general, but are now, I don't want to say aggravated by jujitsu, but sort of impacted by it and maybe heightened a little bit because of that added layer of stress to having a role with a larger opponent or a competition in front of a huge audience, that kind of thing. And it's something that made me see how I could learn in those situations. And it made me understand that my mental health struggles will follow me in every arena of my life. And it's something that I have to continue managing. So when it came into jujitsu, 
it gave me an opportunity, like I said, to sort of test out those strategies and learn to use them kind of on the fly when I need them. And it made me aware that I had to keep tabs on the things that stress me, that cause me anxiety, that make me doubt myself, which in that microcosm of a, of a sport sort of gave me a, a microscope on what I was experiencing in my, in my life in general. So it definitely honed in and focused in on those things. For example, as I mentioned that those intrusive thoughts of, you know, do they think I don't deserve my purple belt? Do I need to work much harder because I'm not at the level I should be at? Are people looking at me thinking, wow, that's a horrible role. Just all of these doubts coming up specifically for jujitsu and realizing that in my life, I have more general and, and broader doubts that come up. And there's, again, I keep using the word parallel because that's absolutely what it is. And that, that parallel between the two and working through those things in a jujitsu setting for the purpose of being more comfortable and more adept at the sport that I love gives me more, I should say, um, aptitude to use those skills in general in, in my life when we're talking about something more um, just regular life stressors and that kind of thing. Mm. Mm. I get it. Cool. If people want to find you, websites, email, social, anything like that, what, what would you share with them? So the website is uh, just my name, Valerie Brasso. It's Valerie with a Y and the last name is B-R-O-S-S-E-A-U. And that has information about my my background in terms of training and education, as well as my lived experience and, and then the things that I offer in terms of services. And that same handle is the Instagram as well, where I try to really offer content that helps people understand better, gives them tools they can apply within their life and um, is full of, of tidbits in terms of things that will help people understand a little bit better and, and feel a little bit less alone. So the Instagram is a place where I really try to engage. I love getting comments and messages and really engaging with people on that, on that platform. So that's one that I really like. And I, I have to as well um, encourage people to follow Submit the Sigma on Instagram and just be aware of that movement within jujitsu in general. It's such a, a powerful statement of making mental health something that is a priority when it comes to being an athlete in our sport and being a practitioner of this art. And it's been something that has brought in a lot of uh, prominent black belts who have shared their experiences with mental health concerns. And that just sort of opens the door for other people to share as well. And some of this thing was really about creating that safe space the same way that I do within my own business. I think that's a really important one as well. Great. And what's next for you? You know, if we, if we touch base in six, 12 months, five years, you know, however far out you want to look, what, mm -hmm. what would you hope we would be talking about in an update? I would hope that we'd be talking about a full-on TED Talk. TEDx is independently organized, and that was what I was a part of, but a, a full TED Talk would be amazing. I'm working on a memoir, so I would love for that to be published. And I, I'm having this feeling that I want to jump back into competition, so maybe mm. some big competitions in terms of jiu-jitsu and continuing to push through that, that self-doubt and that anxiety to, to grow within that and find my, my place. And I've sort of come to an understanding that maybe I will not be the athlete who medals every time. And that's okay. As long as I am improving every time that I compete. And as long as I'm, I'm learning how to manage that anxiety that comes with competition and that I'm being better than, than what I was the day before. So it's, I think having that sort of renewed understanding that my value is not based on the medal around my neck or my place on the podium. It's about the effort that I'm putting in and what I'm learning from it gives me a sense that I, that I perhaps do want to compete again. So we will see when, when training can pick up sort of full force again. We'll see where I end up with that. <laughs> mm, good luck. Good Thank luck. You, let, let me know. We'll, uh, we'll post updates if you send them in. Sounds great. And then the last thing, as we head out, this is your chance to close out the show. So what parting words or wisdom or advice or, I don't know, funny quip would you want to leave the audience with today? I think that what I would want people to take away 
And I hope that it was something they could relate to and was engaging. But if there was a takeaway, it would be both related to mental health and to jujitsu. And that is, again, that, that idea that progress and moving forward is not going to be linear. And having steps backwards or plateaus is normal and is nothing to be ashamed of. And it's just about picking ourselves back up again. So losing a competition, um, feeling like we're not where we want to be in terms of how we're progressing with our technique. It's just about having that belief in ourselves that we can push through and we can, we can move forward. And it's the same with mental health. We may have steps backwards, but it's just about, it sounds quite trite, but it's about never giving up and reaching out for help when we need it and getting the support that we need and just carrying on regardless, which I actually have a tattoo that says that it is matching with Aaron Hurley, who's the founder of Submit the Stigma. And that's something we both very much believe in. Carry on regardless and find the resources that you need to do that, whether that's support from other people or things within yourself. But carrying on would be the last tidbit I'd like to leave people with. Now, to be fair, I did tell you in the intro that this episode was going to get kind of heavy. And, you know, we've had other heavy episodes. We've had subject matter that goes deep. And this won't be the last episode where we do that. I think it's critical that we talk about all aspects of health, including mental health and the benefits that martial arts can have in maintaining and improving mental health. Maybe not for you, but for people around you. Maybe for your children, maybe for your students, maybe for your instructors, or maybe for you. I hope you do check out Ms. Brasso's TEDx talk. It's great stuff. Follow her on social media. Check out these resources. Again, you may not need them, but someone around you might. Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out episode 542. You got the show notes. We've got every other episode over there too. We got transcripts. We got links. You name it, we got it. And if you want to support it, share this episode with somebody that you think might appreciate it. Or you could make a purchase. And of course, we've got the Patreon. If you see somebody out there wearing some whistle kick stuff, make sure you say hello. And if you've got whistle kick stuff, make sure you're wearing it. If you've got guest suggestions, I want to hear them. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.